Every land's future is defined by nature. Its position on the map and even its shape define its mission, which the heir of the land and the sea, man, will make use of according to his needs and also according to his dreams. If we take a good look at the map, we can easily acknowledge the mission that fate bequeathed the island of Leros. The sea embraces the island so tightly that sometimes it seems as if the island may shatter to pieces. Natural bays and harbors abound. Under the pretense of the Italian-Turkish war, Italy conquered the Dodecanese. Nevertheless, the pretense would soon be forgotten and the Italians would remain on the Dodecanese from 1912 until 1943. During those years, Leros was armed and became one huge naval base. World War II begins. The British, who wanted to occupy the Dodecanese before the Germans, arrived on the island of Leros on the 13th of September 1943. The Germans, betrayed by the Italians for a second time, decided to conquer Leros at all costs. Leros, a frontier island of exquisite beauty, still carries in its heart the indelible scars of the war. Batteries and pillboxes manufactured from concrete camouflaged by natural rocks remain until today. They are dug into its mountains like small independent states. All underground galleries and ammunition depots have been blown up. We can understand the magnitude of the bombings from the craters and the shattered rocks which are scattered around the area of the battery. Sizable bases can be found on almost every hill on Leros. Here were based the gigantic Italian cannons with a range of nearly 18 kilometers. Enemy battleships were unable to defend themselves when they were attacked by these cannons because none of the ship's cannons could reach the coast of the island from that distance. From the Bay of Alintas, where the diving center is based, a team is getting ready to dive to a unique shipwreck museum. The Germans, trying to occupy the island, used every possible means from air and land. A big part of their forces were transported to the island with Junkers 52 aircrafts. The dive begins. A Junkers 52, which was carrying parachutists, is lying at the bottom of the sea. It has been caught by a huge net, and it seems like the aircraft is lying peacefully in a gigantic cocoon. The side machine guns are turned towards the surface of the sea with a loading clip suspended, ready to fire. They have remained untouched for nearly 65 years. Andreas Hutter, a machine gunner who flew this specific aircraft and is still alive in Germany, said that the plane had been hit hard in the rear rudder. Many men were lost. Looking inside the aircraft, there are helmets, machine guns, personal equipment, and sometimes human bones. Time has frozen. We read an extract from a letter that was sent to Andreas Hutter's family by the squadron leader of the 6th Air Force Squadron, Mr. Ower. Dear Hutter family, on the 13th of November, 1943, your son, Andreas Hutter, did not came in from the attack of the enemy on the island of Leros. From that day, he has been filed as missing. We hope and we pray, along with you, that your son has been saved and is now a prisoner. I will get in touch with you personally when I have further news. On the 15th of November, 1943, Leros had on its land 22,300 people. 
The English had 600 dead, the Italians nearly 400. The Germans had approximately 600 dead and nearly 2,000 soldiers lost at sea while they were trying to reach the island and reinforce their soldiers on Leros. Today, Belen is tower in the area of Alindas, where the Germans once used as a temporary hospital, has been turned into an exceptional museum. The tower is a building of unique construction that adds an air stolen from the era of the medieval knights. On the ground floor of the tower, valuable paintings Engravings and other pieces of popular art are exhibited. Climbing the stairs to the first floor, time goes backward and a large number of objects are there and take us back to World War II. Helmets of all the armed forces that fought there, soldiers' personal equipment, maps, documents, guns of different range and size. Photographs and many other impressive objects have been gathered here from all around Leros. Findings from the battleship Queen Olga and also from other shipwrecks help us to continue our journey through space and time. Just after his victory, the German General Müller met with the wounded at the Lenis Tower. The battle lasted for 52 days. A German officer who had fought from the Polish frontier to the Russian Taigani said that the Battle of Leros was the most ruthless battle he had ever experienced. With a traditional fishing boat, the diving team begins a daily expedition. Leaving behind the Bay of Alindas, passing the rocky island of Strongili, the team will at last anchor off the peaceful bay of Archangelos. All the natural ports of Leros were either guarded or mined. At the entries of Laki and Partheni, metallic nets were cast. In the warehouses, there was enough material for laying mines all along the coast of Alindas. At the big natural port of Partheni, an Italian anti-submarine boat dragged a huge metallic net which secured the port from one end to the other. After a short briefing from the head of the expedition, the divers are getting ready to dive into the entrance of the Bay of Partheni. Another shipwreck of unique beauty is visible at 39 meters. It is the Italian anti-submarine boat which carried the huge metallic net that sealed the port's entrance. The workers and the thick cables that drag the metallic net are still there. It seems like this picture is going to come to life and the huge net will rise again. Swimming inside the boat, the signs of war are visible everywhere. A bomb from an enemy aircraft which hit the boat cut her side horribly. Bullets are scattered everywhere. What the divers experience is an indescribable quietness. Each diver experiences a sweet loneliness immersed in his thoughts and listening only to the sound of his breathing. Continuing our journey, we cross rough paths which bring us to hills with incredible views of where many buildings, large cannon bases, pillboxes of unique construction and technique have all been salvaged. On almost every hill and in every cape, we can find the remains of the defensive facilities of the island. 
the island of Leros was literally armed to the teeth. There were five nautical batteries, nine batteries against torpedoes, and 12 air raid batteries. Of the 52 days of the Battle of Leros, during the first six there were 300 air raids with 1,369 aircraft flights over its sky. The air raid batteries shot nearly 300,000 shells. The front command toward the sea, along with the anti-aircraft ground defense command, Command Fam Dicat, had their headquarters on Patella Mountain. The communication centers of both commands were connected inside the mountain. The secured space of the telephone communication center intercommunicated through a horizontal tunnel with an observation tower which was placed on top of the center. In this space there were telephone booths on the one side which received the observations and others which forwarded the commands to the parties on the other side. From Fam Dicat command, only the secured space of the telephone exchange center was salvaged. All the rest of the external junctions were completely destroyed. Continuing their journey, the diving team visits one more shipwreck. At the Bay of Belefutis, 16 meters under sea level, lies a big part of the fuselage of a German bombardier, a Henkel 111. The exact identity of this aircraft has yet to be discovered. It seems to have been dragged there by fishermen's nets. The rest of the aircraft is scattered around and remains to be revealed. This specific aircraft had a five-member crew. It was 16 meters long with a wingspan of 23 meters. During the landing of the German troops on the island of Leros, the main body of the naval forces landed mostly on the northeast coast of the island. Further north, on Belefutis Hill, Battery 888 managed to attack two landing boats that immediately went up in flames. One of them tried to escape the battle by moving further out to sea so as to have the protection of the anti-torpedo boats. The second was hit from the fire of the 888 battery and suffered severe damage to her rudder.
Then it started to move in circles around the rocky island of Strongili, hitting again and again on its grey rocks. This same boat is lying today at the bottom of the sea, at 17 meters depth, very close to the island of Strongili. The boat was so severely hit that she was cut in two, divided into two major pieces. Flare pistols and different kinds of armament are still lying at the bottom of the Aegean. The super construction of the landing boat, the ramp and all the other constructions of the boat have collapsed. Observing the shipwreck more closely, somewhere hidden in the sand lies a soldier's gear, his radio, his flask, the soles of his boots, his helmet are lying there quietly. English headquarters was dug inside the hill of Merovigli. Its roof was made of 20 meters of hard rock and it had two exits in the shape of a spear. The one looked over the Bay of Laki and the other one over the Bay of Alindas. From there, Major Tilney could see everything that happened on the island. It was really a strategic point. But the Germans also knew that. It was there that most of the bombardiers showed their fiercest face. The toughest battle was at Merovigli, as one the people of Leros watched in awe. In the area of St. Nicholas Radio, the Italian Shielded Communication Center has been preserved until today. Its double, heavy shielded doors, its armed windows with door handles similar to a submarine muzzle, make this building an important monument. When Leros fell, the Germans took over all the Italian facilities. The German Eagle still remains in one of these rooms. The three antennas stand arrogantly as if this battle had never happened as if someone just forgot them there. On the 26th of September 1943, the destroyer ship Queen Olga, along with English Intrepid, were surprise attacked while they were anchored inside the port of Laki. The tragedy that took place that day was beyond imagination. The Queen Olga was literally blown into the air while the oil that she was carrying burned around her on the sea. Eighty people died on the spot, a legendary boat for the Greek naval army. Just a step further, close to the pier, the English Intrepid is also sinking. And the catastrophe continues. Small boats, barges, floating cranes, hydroplanes, anything that floats is fiercely bombarded. 31 meters under the sea lies silently what is left of the destroyer ship Queen Olga. Portholes, shell cases and cannon shells are some of the signs that indicate that this was once upon a time a battleship. The power of a destructive war slowly unfolds before our eyes.
Continuing our diving at La Quay, we head towards the entrance of this natural port. A dark bulge can be distinguished at the depth of 45 meters below the sea. We meet with mountains of big metallic circles that, if stretched, form an impenetrable metallic net. Pontoons, big fish, and a multitude of sea life complete this serene, captivating dark blue. Coming up to a depth of 24 meters, a huge metallic buoy that has been left there since the war is still hanging like the ghost of a flying saucer. At the same place of St. Nicholas Radio, there is another private collection filled with relics from the Battle of Leros in a special space. The love of Mr. Yanis Paraponaris, his passion for findings of the Second World War, led him to create a sizable collection. Uniforms, gear, missiles from ships, bombs, mines, even aircraft canopies decorate this small area. In an environment so warm, with so many objects around you, you feel like you're touching them, like you're holding them yourself. Following the narrow road to the village of Platanos, we arrive at still another impressive private collection, the one of Mr. Canaris. Tassos Canaris experienced the battle when he was just a boy, and his life is history itself. Viaggio all'ero era un miracolo, Many times, he has been the main reason for the reunion of old comrades in arms and even enemy soldiers that when they finally met, they embraced each other wholeheartedly. He owns a great collection of photographs personal photographs of the soldiers, letters, and all the bibliography that has ever been written about the Battle of Leros. At the area of Merica, one of many of the Italian shelters has been turned into a lively museum. Around it, many different vehicles of the armed forces are exhibited. This was the tunnel of the Italian Navy Command and it was so much better than the British commands. Its floors were made of concrete. It had good lighting and excellent ventilation. Tunnels and dim light, guns, maps and information show us an even crueler image of this hard battle. While time passes, the shelters became sites. The shipwrecks became monuments. The barracks became museums. And the pain of the war became history. Mm -hmm. 
Leros, an alternative proposition for your vacation, a special destination that combines natural beauty and historic memory.